really important uh, for Christian people to understand. Perhaps it's the most important thing, but most widely misunderstood thing within the Christian tradition, and that is the meaning of Jesus' death. Kind of a morbid topic, but really important to sort of wrap our heads around, particularly as we move toward Easter. You know, we love the Easter part, right? Resurrection, Easter eggs, all that kind of stuff. But this is the part that we have to go through in order to understand what Easter is all about. And so I want to begin this morning by telling you a story about myself uh, as a kid uh, growing up in the church. It was the custom in my family to, uh, to go to church, particularly during Christmas and Easter, Holy Week uh, services and observances and so on. And I can remember as a kid going to Good Friday services with my parents and my siblings, and one of the hymns that was always sung on Good Friday was the hymn, Were You There? Were You There When They Crucified My Lord? If you don't know it, or even if you do, I'd ask now that you'd turn to hymn number 218 in the red hymnal. Because I want to look at these words. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Now, oftentimes, this hymn is done as a solo. It's a very moving, it's a very somber uh, point in the Good Friday liturgy. But the implication of the hymn is that no, not, not only was I there at the crucifixion, but you were too. And this is a common way that the death of Jesus or the passion narrative has been told in Western cultures. Interestingly, it's not the way in which it's told in Eastern cultures. I'm going to get to that in a minute. But it's what we've inherited uh, through the Roman church and the European church. Were you there when... When they crucified my Lord. There's another hymn, too. I'm not going to give you the, the hymn number, but you can look it up if you want. There's a, uh, there's a directory in the back of the hymnal. It's, Ah, Holy Jesus, how hast thou offended? Written way back in the early 17th century, it contains these lines. Who was the guilty who brought this upon thee? Alas, my treason Jesus hath undone thee. "'Twas, Lord Jesus, I, it was denied thee, I crucified thee." And then there's another old favorite that many are familiar with, "'O Sacred Head, Now Wounded.'" It's a very old hymn, oftentimes sung on Good Friday, it dates back to the 13th century, and it says essentially the same thing with these words, "'Mine, mine was the transgression, but thine the deadly pain.'" What is the point of all this? Well, believe it or not, there is one. You see, in shorthand, this is what we call the payment understanding of Jesus' death. The payment understanding of Jesus' death. It's also known as uh, the substitutionary or satisfaction understanding of the cross. The former emphasizes that Jesus died in our place as, as the substitute for the punishment we all deserve. The latter emphasizes that Jesus somehow satisfies God's demand for obedience and the wrath of God against sin. Both are about the cross as payment for sin. Now, if I were to give all of you a quiz this morning, you may not have labeled that understanding of Jesus' death as the payment or the uh, substitutionary or the satisfaction but it's the story that, that we just absorb through kind of cultural osmosis in our society. The result is that the payment understanding of Jesus' death has been a core element of what I call common or heaven and hell Christianity. It's kind of, it's kind of the Christianity that we all hear about but oftentimes don't understand for it, uh, very well. It's a defining feature, uh, particularly today, of... Uh, conservative, crea uh, conservative Christianity, both in its Protestant and Catholic forms. So for many Christians, and probably the majority of Christians, even those who attend uh, more progressive churches, 
This payment understanding of Jesus' death is kind of the default position shaping our understanding of Jesus' death and sacrifice. And really, when you think about it, the, the, the meaning of Holy Week and Good Friday in its totality, indeed, the ultimate significance of Jesus' life. We oftentimes hear uh, pastors and others say his purpose was to die for the sins of the world. Now, I'm arguing today that most Christians believe this, or at least they think they're supposed to. Some who are a little more critical in their thinking wonder whether they can really be Christian if they don't believe the payment understanding of the cross because they simply take it for granted that it's part of orthodox and traditional Christianity. However, and if you haven't paid any attention so far, this is where you want to pay attention. However, it's important to realize that the payment understanding of Jesus' death on the cross, one, is not ancient, two, it's not in the Bible, and three, was not present during the first thousand years of Christianity. Do I need to say that again? It's not ancient, it's not in the Bible, it was not present in the first thousand years of Christianity. Now, it's true that language referring to Jesus' death is found throughout the New Testament, particularly in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In fact, they focus heavily on it. More chapters are given over to the last week of his life than the previous 30 years. There's lots of language within the New Testament, particularly in the writings of Paul, language like for us and sacrifice goes back to the very earliest times of the Christian church. But here's the important part. The substitutionary understanding of this language was actually first articulated by a guy named Anselm of Canterbury in the year 1097. So for almost 1,100 years, nobody thought in these terms. He wrote a book that addressed this very question. It was titled, Why Did God Be Become Human? incarnate in Jesus? Why did God become human incarnate in Jesus? And this was his answer. And remember, he lived in England in a feudal society. His answer was that God's retributive justice requires that the penalty for our sins must be paid from the human side somehow. But here's the problem. We're all sinners and thus cannot adequately make the payment. Only a perfect human can. But a human can't be perfect unless also divine. So God became human in Jesus in order to pay the price for our sins. Sound familiar? It's what you hear every single day on fundamentalist Christian TV and radio. But what most people don't understand was that this was an absolute innovation. It did not exist before 1097. That it was not central to the first thousand years of Christianity is confirmed by its absolute absence in Eastern Christianity. You'll remember that the separation between the Christian West and the Christian East happened in 1054. This was 43 years before Anselm's book. And even today, this understanding of Jesus' death is absence, absent within Eastern Orthodoxy. The payment understanding of Jesus' death also generates real serious theological problems, I think hang-ups for modern people, when it's understood as the only or the real or the ultimate reasons for Jesus' death. There are a whole bunch of these things, but I'm just going to focus on, on four or five of them because we don't have much time. Here's the first one. It makes Jesus' death part of God's plan of salvation. Given the internal logic of the understanding, somehow Jesus had to die. The cost of our disobedience in this way of thinking must be paid for, and God sent Jesus to do that. Thus, his death was ultimately God's will. Really? Here's a question. Was it God's will that Jesus be killed? Is God some sort of an ogre that demands blood sacrifice? Is that the God that Jesus talked about? I think not. 
Number two, it emphasizes the wrath of God towards sin and the wrath that must be satisfied and that Jesus' death somehow did that. But here's a question. Is that what God, the God whom Jesus proclaimed and revealed, is like? Is God like some sort of an authoritarian king or parent who demands payment for obedience? It's not the God that Jesus talked about. Jesus called God Daddy, Abba. Number three, because it makes the death of Jesus the most important thing about him, it obscures the importance of his life and his message and his activity. Remember, he, you know, he lived on this earth for 33 years and did a whole bunch of stuff. You know, the Bible's filled with his teachings. This all happened before his death. So question, do Jesus' message and activity matter as much as his death? Might there be an important connection between the two? And finally, number four, it makes believing that Jesus died to pay for our sins more important than following him. Christianity then becomes believing that he has done for us what we cannot do for ourselves, rather than participating in the things that he was passionate about, the things that animated his life and led to his death. It creates what one evangelical critic of the payment understanding has called vampire Christians. That is, Christians interested in Jesus primarily and only for his blood and not much else. <sighs> Gory. A final problem with the payment understanding of seeing Jesus' death as a part of God's plan of salvation, you know, as something that had to happen, is that it obscures and even renders invisible the historical reasons of his crucifixion and the theological significance of why it happened. I want you to ask yourself uh, today, why did the Romans and the temple authorities arrest and execute Jesus? Why, why did they arrest him? Why did they kill him? You know, crucifixion was a form of Roman capital punishment. Well, the authorities killed Jesus because of what he was doing. Namely, he had a growing reputation as a teacher and a healer. Of course, that in itself wasn't enough to get him killed. But what did get him in trouble is that he had become a fierce public critic of the authorities, the people who governed his country, the domination system, the Roman system that had imposed itself on his country. He was critical of the way that they had put the world together because it was incredibly unjust. So to emphasize in the world of the first century that Jesus was crucified signaled at once that this gospel was an anti-imperial gospel. And yes, it was very, very political. Some perhaps, and perhaps many or most Christians, at least in North American cultures, are very surprised that the heart of Jesus' message was the coming of the kingdom of God. More commonly, people think that his message was, I don't know, eternal life, or about believing in him as the son of God, again, whose purpose was to die for our sins, the sins of the world, or about the importance of loving one another, or something else. The kingdom of God, however, was not about an afterlife, it was not about how to get to heaven, but it was rather about the transformation of life here in the present, your life and my life in the now. Though this notion is, I think, also surprising to some Christians, it really shouldn't be. You know, every time we pray the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father, it's the best known Christian prayer in the world, perhaps the best known prayer anywhere, we pray these words, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. On earth. You see, in the world of Jesus, the phrase kingdom of God had not only religious but also deeply political meanings. Religious in the sense that it was about God and political in the sense that kingdom referred to the most common form of organizing societies at that time. Jesus used the word kingdom to say what life would be like on earth if God were king rather than the rulers of this world. 
rather than if Caesar were king. And Jesus took this proclamation of the kingdom of God to Jerusalem for the season of Passover. And on the first day of that week, what we Christians call Palm Sunday, Jesus entered in Jerusalem in a very provocative way. It was pre-planned. It was a very public act. He rode into the city on a donkey, echoing a text from the prophet Isaiah that spoke of a king of peace who would banish war and speak peace to the nations. Jesus' entry proclaimed that his message was about a kingdom, the kingdom of God, in which there would be peace and not war, a kingdom not based on violence. Now, friends, don't get me wrong. For millions and millions of Christians around the world, the payment understanding of Jesus' death has great power. And in many ways, it has transformed lives and continues to transform lives. At its best, it expresses the depth of God's and Jesus' love for us. But I think it should be viewed as it is in Scripture, as only a very, very minor metaphor at best. It's not the main thing, and that's what I'm trying to get across this morning. I'm suggesting that the major metaphor of Jesus' death is this. We need to understand that Jesus literally is the human face of what God looks like in human form. Jesus is the human face of what God looks like in hum human form. It's what John Dominic Cross, in a great New Testament scholar, says, Jesus is what God looks like in sandals. That is because when you look at Jesus, he lives fully. Nothing diminished his life. And he never diminished anybody else's life. People betrayed him, and he responded by loving them. People denied him, and he responded by loving them. People forsook him, and he responded by loving them. People tormented him, and he responded by loving them. People killed him, and he responded by loving them. How else could he communicate to people like you and me that there is nothing that we can ever do that there is nothing that we can ever be that will place us outside the boundaries of the love of God. And so it's not, or only, that we are some worthless, inadequate person that God has to come in and rescue. Rather, and this is, by the way, what the Bible says. I'm not making it up. It is that God's love is so abundant and so overwhelming that this love calls us to live and to love and to be all that we can be so that God's love can live in and through us. That is a very different Jesus-like way to think about God. And I hope that you will. Amen.